ecstasy. It is a drug that is indescribable. It makes you feel happier than being five on Christmas morning. It makes the touch of a stranger feel like a fuzzy hug from a teddy bear. It also can make you hornier than a 14 year old schoolboy. These are the feelings that I felt while I was on this drug at a bonfire party in the woods. I was dancing to techno music with the prettiest girl at the party. Things were getting heated and sweaty between us. So we decided to break away from the party to find a good spot to unleash the sexual tension that we were building up. We walked quite a distance just to make sure none of our sleazeball friends could see us. That's when we stumbled across an abandoned looking house. It was made of wood and seemed to have been there for quite a while. I suggested to her to go in. She didn't feel comfortable going in, but I ended up convincing her that it would be better to do it in the house rather than up against some tree. So we went in. It was dark. Only a small light from the moon shined in. I looked at her, moved in closer, and began to kiss her neck. She started unbuttoning my pants and breathing heavier. Next, our shirts came off, her breasts against my chest. Her skin was amazing. Suddenly, we were interrupted by the sound of footsteps walking slowly across the outside of the house. What was that? She said. I don't know, but I'm going to kill whichever asshole followed us to watch. I handed her her shirt and told her to stay right here. I walked outside and shut the door behind me. I walked around the entire house. I didn't see anyone though. I shouted out a warning to whoever the pervert was that they better leave. I took one more look out into the trees and the bushes just to make sure. But again, there was no one. Maybe it was just the drugs and the paranoia that made us hear something. I turned around to walk back into the house, but when I went to open the door, it was locked. I started banging on the door and yelling for her to unlock it. She screamed back that she can't unlock it. I then ran to the window, and when I looked into the house, there was a dark figure, around six feet tall, standing right behind her. I screamed to her, there's someone behind you. She turned around and the man put his hands around her and began choking her. I ran straight back to the door, stepped a few feet back, and used all my body weight to break down the door. And when I did, all I saw was the girl on her hands and knees, coughing and breathing heavily. The figure of the man was gone. I ran through the abandoned house looking for the guy, but there was no one in the house but the two of us. We quickly ran out of that house and back to the party, and then we had a friend drive us home. I don't know what happened that night. I don't know what I saw. Maybe it was a man. I don't know. Maybe I actually encountered a ghost. My wife Ashley and I are very outdoorsy. We enjoy nature and camping and hiking. Every summer, we go camping at least three times. So, needless to say, we were excited to get on the road to this year's first trip. We packed our gear and hit the road. After a few hours, we arrived to the campsite and set up our tent. We made good time and got to the site a few hours earlier than we thought we would. So instead of relaxing for the first night, we decided to go on a hike while the sun was still out. As we were hiking, we came across an old abandoned brick house. Normally, people would probably just see the house and move on. But being the adventurous type of people that we were, we decided to investigate this old house. We went in. The house was dusty and stunk horribly. We noticed that there was a door on the floor 
that you could open and walk down to the basement. When we opened the door, a wave of stench rose up and into our nostrils. We got down the steps, and each step croaked from old age. When we got down there, we could see that the floor was covered in animal bones, and even some decaying animals as well. That was enough for us to leave. But what we saw next will never leave my memory. There, laying on the top of the pile of animal bones, was a skull of a human head. My wife screamed, and I grabbed her, and we ran out of that house and straight to the police. We ended up finding out that it was the skull of a hiker that went missing a few weeks prior. But what was probably the scariest part of this whole situation was that the skull was the only part of the man that was down in that basement. Where was the rest of the body? When I was 10, I was in the Boy Scouts. At first, I was only in it because my parents made me do it, but I ended up liking it after some time. Every year, our Scoutmaster takes us on a camping trip to learn how to identify plants and how to navigate through the woods if we ever got lost. We had to do the buddy system for when we went out at night to explore. My buddy's name was Josh. We had become good friends in the last two years. The camping trip was a three-day adventure, and everything was going great. Until the second night. After a day of hiking and fishing and learning new types of plants, all of us were huddled around the campfire. The fire was almost out, and we were all going to go to sleep after the fire died. Josh told the scoutmaster that he had to pee. The scoutmaster looked at me and said, Take your buddy out back, about ten yards, and then come right back. Josh and I got up and headed out to the woods. We got about ten yards out, and I told Josh to go up a little further so that I didn't have to hear him pee. After about five minutes, Josh never came back to where I was standing. I called out his name a few times, but he didn't respond. I figured he walked past me and back to the camp, and I simply just didn't notice him walking by. So I turned back and went back to camp. When I got there, the scoutmaster looked at me and asked, Where's Josh? I was confused. I said, You mean he's not here? Instantly, the scoutmaster asked where he was. I said, He never met back up with me, and I thought he came back here. Right away, he blew his whistle and got all the troops together and told us to lock arms. He then went into his backpack and pulled out all the flashlights that he had and told everyone that Josh was missing and we needed to search for him. All the kids started freaking out and getting scared, but we went out and began the search. Several hours went by, but still no sign of Josh. The boys started to get tired. After all, they were only 10 and it had to have been around 1 a.m. by now. Luckily, there was another adult with us, and he took the kids back to camp to go to sleep. But the scoutmaster and I kept searching. About half an hour later, we came across an abandoned house. We thought maybe Josh got lost and scared and found this house and went inside to wait until morning. We then approached the house. The door was already half open, so we entered. We looked in the house for a few minutes, and then the scoutmaster went into one room while I followed behind him. After taking one step into the room, the scoutmaster put his arm across my chest to block me as he said these words in a quivering voice. Oh my sweet Jesus. I pushed his arm away and was able to see inside. There, laying on the ground, was the body of Josh. His arms, legs, and head were severed from his body in a pool of blood. I instantly threw up, and the scoutmaster picked me up, threw me over his shoulder, and ran as fast as he could back to the camp. When we got there, we rounded up the boys and left the camp to find a phone to call the police. 
The police came and investigated, but no one ever discovered who or what killed little Josh. Maybe it was an animal. Maybe it was a person. Needless to say, that was the last year I was a Boy Scout. I had always heard the story of Mr. Craven growing up. The story about when his wife murdered him. He was abusing her daily, in some of the worst ways. One night, he lifted his fist to strike her, and she shoved him down the stairs. He broke his neck on the way down. A few friends were spending the night at my house during the weekend and my parents always went to sleep at nine, and never left their room once their door closed. So, being the 17-year-olds that we were, we liked to sneak out at night and roam the town. We waited until 10 p.m. Then, we put our shoes on and snuck out of my house with the bottle of alcohol that we stole earlier that day. While we were walking around town, we approached the street where Mr. Craven was murdered. No one had lived there since the murder. I dared my friend to go in the house. He said the only way he would go in is if we all went in. So being young and drunk, we went in. We kicked a window in and climbed through. We were being loud and obnoxious and goofing off in there. I think we acted that way to mask the fact that we were all truly terrified to be in that house. While we were downstairs messing around, we heard footsteps coming from upstairs. Instantly, the four of us froze and looked towards the stairs. Hello? No one replied, but I slowly crept towards the stairs. I looked up the flight of stairs, but no one was there. I took a few more slow steps up the stairs. Right when I was about halfway up the stairs, a man stepped out from around the corner and stood at the top of the stairs. His head was completely turned around backwards. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran down the stairs. My friends and I jumped out of the window and ran as fast as our legs could go back to my house. We quickly snuck back into my house and went to my room. I wanted to wake my parents and tell them what happened, but I couldn't. Otherwise, they would know we snuck out and we would be grounded. So, we just kept our mouths shut and went to sleep. I'm not sure if my mind was playing tricks on me in that house. Maybe it was. Maybe I was just really drunk. Or maybe I just saw Mr. Craven. In the last five years, my best friend and I have been into exploring abandoned houses and buildings. However, we stopped doing it after what happened when we explored the house on Shore Street. Shore Street is a very long road that stretches directly from the city that we live in all the way to the country. There are countless buildings and houses along the road, but towards the end, out in the middle of nowhere, there's a few houses, and they all look to be abandoned. One evening, we took our flashlights and headed out to the one house that looked the most run down and forgotten. There was a small barbed wire fence to hop, but it wasn't a big deal for us being 18 years old and in pretty good physical condition. As we were walking up, we were both stopped by the unmistakable noise that we heard coming from inside the house. We looked at each other and laughed. We were a bit creeped out, but honestly, it just made us want to go inside even more. It made it more exciting. We walked up to the house and tried to open the front door. No surprise, it was locked. Then my friend walked over to the window and started taking off the screen. As soon as he dropped the screen, he turned around and started sprinting away from the house. I was startled and confused, but knew that he must have seen a person. I started to run away as well. 
but I couldn't help myself. I turned around and saw why he started running away. Inside of the house, there were two kids standing out the window looking out. They were twins, and they looked like a nightmare. I've never been one to believe in monsters or Bigfoot, but one early morning in the summer of 1994, my opinion on that subject changed. I was 15, and my dad and I woke up very early and packed his pickup truck and headed to a lake to go fishing. It was something that my dad and I have been doing every year since I was eight. We drove about two hours away and got to the lake. We pushed his little silver boat out onto the water and we hopped on. We drove out into the middle of the lake and we began fishing. I remember that the fish were sleeping that morning because we weren't getting any bites. My dad could tell that I was getting kind of bummed out. So he leaned over, reached into his cooler and pulled out a beer. He said in a soft voice, don't tell your mom. And then he handed me a beer. I've never drinking before, so after drinking the beer, I felt a little bit buzzed. My dad chuckled at my goofiness and turned back to continue fishing. I faced the opposite direction and began fishing again as well. It was still dead in the water, so I stopped concentrating on my fishing line and began daydreaming while looking into the water. And then in an instant, my focus was broken. When I looked into the water, I saw a large creature swim past me under the water. The only way I can describe what I saw was it looked like an alligator, but it had red skin and looked like there was an orange glow around it. I jumped back into the boat and told my dad what I just saw. He laughed and said that that's the beer talking. He didn't believe me. But whatever sort of beast it was scared the living hell out of me. I'm 52, and I live in Indiana. I live in a rural area with some land around my house. I live alone with my dog. I was sitting in my house one night at about 11.45 p.m. I had just gotten home from work at 10, and I was watching TV when my dog started barking towards the backyard. I told him to lay down, but he kept barking, which was unusual because she was a very well-trained dog and always sat when I told her to. So I got up to see what she was looking at. I looked through the back door and there was nothing outside. I started heading back to the living room, but then my dog's barking went crazy and she was jumping at the door. I walked back to the door and looked out again, but I still wasn't seeing anything. So I opened the door and went outside. It was hard to see because in rural areas, there aren't street lights. But I did notice something. There was something above my house. It was dark gray and almost completely blended into the night sky. It was very large and round. I was trying to figure out what I was looking at when all at once, the lights in my house all went out. I ran back inside and flipped on the light switch in the kitchen and nothing was there but my dog walked up next to me and started staring down the dark hallway. She was barking non-stop, but she also had that whimper type of bark too. My heart started pounding as my dog and I stared into the darkness. I slowly reached my left hand up and over to the next light switch. I flicked it up. What I saw was the most unnerving thing I'd ever seen. When the light came on, I saw a lean body with gray silk-like skin standing in my living room. It was snarling at me with its mouth hanging open. It must have had 50 teeth, all different shapes and sizes, and its eyes were a dark green color. I slowly stepped backwards. After I took a few steps back, the creature began stepping towards me. This is when I shouted my dog's name. My dog sprinted past the creature and up to me right as I opened my front door. The creature let out a loud screech. 
and then my dog and I took off down the street running as fast as we could. We hid behind some bushes while I kept an eye on my house. Within 20 minutes, I saw that gray thing floating in the sky take off. I slowly approached my house after that, and I was relieved to find no one in my house. That was a few years ago, and I haven't encountered anything since. But sometimes, late at night, I still feel like I can sense that gray thing floating above my house. At the time of this story, I was only about 10 years old, but it was a few days before I turned 11, so I was really excited. I had been into collecting older video game systems, so my dad was bringing me to some shady hole-in-the-wall shop that was supposedly selling a Nintendo 64 with the original Super Smash Bros. game. I had been to this shop once before, and I really didn't like it. It was just a rented basement. It smelled awful, it was cramped, and there were leaking pipes sticking out of the walls. But I really didn't care, I just wanted that Nintendo 64. When we arrived there, my dad decided he didn't want to go inside, because he knew the guy that owned the shop. And he wanted to spend the day with me, so he would probably just end up staying in there talking to the guy for the whole day. So I took my $15 and marched down there ready to get out as soon as I got in. I greeted my dad's friend, and right off the bat, asked where the Nintendo 64 was. He said, Oh yeah, it's in that back closet over there, on a shelf. If he said that to me nowadays, I would be smart enough to turn around and get out of there. But of course, I was a naive kid, and I really just wanted that game. I opened the closet, which made that squeaking sound. And to my surprise, there was a cardboard box that had Sharpie written on the side of it, in quotes saying N64. It was on a high shelf, so I called the man to help me reach it. When he came in the closet, he closed the door behind him, and I know what you're thinking, but this surprisingly isn't the scary part of the story. I paid the guy my money, and I walked back out to the car. When we got home, I darted up to my room and opened the crusted box, but what I found inside wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Inside of that box was the dry, decaying, mangled corpse of a cat. I screamed the loudest I would ever scream in my life. My dad quickly came up and nearly vomited. The rest of the story is kind of fuzzy because I tried to block this from my memory. This happened a little over a decade ago but it's safe to say that my dad isn't friends with that creep anymore. I've always considered myself a loner, not because I'm not likable, but because I enjoy time to myself. Going camping alone leaves me as one with myself and the wilderness. It's amazing, but I don't go alone anymore. A year ago, I went up to my favorite camping spot in California. I brought a case of beer and a few good books to read. I set up my tent and kicked my feet up in a chair and started enjoying my quiet time. After a while, I started seeing a few random hikers walk by and wave to me as they passed. But then this one guy hiked by, and he didn't wave. He kind of just stopped walking and stared at me. I got this weird vibe from him. I tried to keep reading my book, but he just stood there staring. So I looked over and said, Hey, how's it going? He didn't respond. He just turned his head and walked away after that. Weird. So nighttime came, and my fire was burning out after several hours. So I went into my tent and went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and noticed the fire was burning again. I got up to go see what was going on. I unzipped the tent and I got out, but no one was there. I turned around to go back into my tent to put on my shoes, and when I turned around, five feet above my tent, 
the man who was staring at me earlier hung himself using a tree branch that hung over my tent and he was dangling right in front of me. I lost feelings in my legs and stumbled to the ground from shock. I ran to my truck and I called the police. They came out and I guess they cut him down because the body was gone once I returned to grab my things. I packed up and went home, but the image of that man's dead body hanging there still is and will always be burned into my memory. A long time ago, when I was a young man, my friends and I were camping at a public campsite. We were hanging out around the campfire, drinking beers and smoking weed. We were having a blast. But during the partying, the mood went from fun to creepy. While the fun was taking place, a homeless man stumbled upon us out of the bushes. At this point, it was dark outside, so it seemed like he came out of nowhere. My friends and I went laughing to pure silence, because this guy was covered in blood. Dude, what the fuck happened to you? Are you alright? The man looked us up and down, from left to right, and smiled slowly then started laughing. We started getting really freaked out. This guy seemed unpredictable. What are you laughing at, dude? Then the man turned around, looked away halfway back at me and said, Don't go to sleep. And then he took off running back into the woods and into the darkness. I was completely terrified. My friends ended up taking turns staying awake throughout the night in the case he'd come back. He never did. We never figured out what that guy was doing. And we never figured out where the blood came from either. A group of friends and I went camping one weekend. It was me, two guys, and our friend Jennifer. We were at a fairly public campsite. Not many people, but some. At night, we were all drinking around the campfire. And across the campsite was another group of guys around our age. They noticed us drinking and stumbled over and asked if we wanted to drink together. And us, being the crazy social people we were, quickly said, For sure. After an hour, a few of us were puking. A few of us were falling asleep in our chairs by the fire. And then the two men said their goodbyes and went back to their campsite. I helped Jennifer into her tent, and then I went into mine. In the middle of the night, I heard something knock over some of our beer cans that were on the ground. I figured it was a raccoon that made its way to find some food, but then I heard voices. I got up to see what it was. I looked left to right, and that's when I noticed Jennifer's tent was unzipped, which was weird, because I remember zipping it up for her. I walked to her tent, and when I looked inside, I saw those two guys in her tent. I shouted, what the hell are you doing? And that's when I saw next to the guys rope and duct tape. I yelled for my friends to wake up and they came out of their tents and saw what was happening. The two guys tried to give some weak explanation of what they were doing, but it was pretty obvious. These guys were sick. Needless to say, my friends and I kicked the shit out of them. We told them if they ever came back, we would kill them. And they didn't come back. And luckily, Jenny was still passed out from drinking, so we never told her what happened. I'm just glad that I heard what I heard. My cousins and I went on our annual camping trip last year. Everything was great until the night came. We fished throughout the day and cooked s'mores at night over the fire. Two of my cousins had a camping trailer, and my cousin and I shared a tent about five yards from their camper. We were also pretty tired after a long day of fishing on the lake, so we decided to crash early and let the fire burn out instead of throwing dirt on it. I wasn't sleeping well, since I was sleeping on the ground, so I was drifting in and out of sleep all night. But in the middle of the night, I was kind of awake. I saw the silhouette of a man standing on the outside of the tent. I laughed a little because I figured it was my older cousin trying to mess with us, and I quietly shouted out, Go to sleep, bro. The next morning, when we all woke up, I said to my cousins, Good try guys, but you didn't scare me. They both looked at each other puzzled. 
What are you talking about? They said. I set our tent, trying to mess with us. They both got this nervous look on their faces and said, We never left the trailer last night. My dad used to be big into camping when I was born. So you can imagine, once I turned old enough, he took me on a father-son camping trip. The ride to the camping spot was great. The experience of setting up our tents was great. Finding wood for the campfire was great. But that night was anything far from great. We were cooking s'mores around at the campfire and my dad was telling me ghost stories. I remember them being so corny, but I loved how excited my dad was to try and scare me with his lame stories. So I acted scared. But shortly after, my dad was adding another log to the fire, and I was looking off into the trees. And that's when I noticed something. Two yellow dots that looked like they were glowing were pointed right at me from the dark woods. I said, Dad, look, what is that? He looked and said, I don't see anything. So I figured my mind was playing tricks on me. Maybe I actually did get scared from those stories. So then I went to my tent. My dad fell asleep pretty fast, but I was cold, so I couldn't sleep. While laying there awake, I saw something creeping up on the side of our tent. I couldn't make out what it was. It didn't look like a man. It had a weird shape to it, but then the thing stopped walking, and I could see its body turn towards the tent. I tried shaking my dad awake, but he was out. I started shaking, and then the figure pressed what I can only describe as its face up against the tent, and then two yellow dots appeared. This time, I knew they were eyes. I screamed, and it woke my dad up. But when my dad looked to see what I saw, the thing disappeared. My dad never believed me when I told him what I saw. But there's only one thing I know for certain. There definitely were two yellow eyes glaring at me. I live here in a part of North Texas that frequently gets tornadoes. The first dozen times that we got tornadoes, it scared me to death. But by now, I pretty much know the drill when it happens. Go straight to the basement, across the yard, and get down there and get as deep in the back as you can. But during this night, the tornado wasn't the scary part. My parents and I were eating dinner late one night when we noticed the TV switched from our show that we were watching to an immediate tornado warning. Mom and Dad threw down their forks and jumped up from the table and grabbed me by the shirt and said, You know the drill. We ran out of the house and across the yard. On our way to the basement, we could see the tornado off in the distance. We climbed down the steps into the basement and my dad shut the door and locked it. We started heading to the back when we all stopped dead in our tracks and silently stared at the back of the basement. In the shadows, standing there, was a man. He didn't say anything to us. He just stared back at us and giggled in the creepiest giggle I had ever heard. None of us could move because we were so scared of this stranger and we couldn't leave because of the tornado. We had to just stand there in the dark with this creepy stranger. Once the tornado passed, we all ran out of the basement and into the house to call the police. The dispatcher said that our problem was low priority since all of the other officers were out helping the survivors. So my dad hung up and went back to the basement to confront the man. But when he went out there, the man was gone and never seen by us again. I like to call myself a storm chaser Am I professional? No, but I get the biggest rush when I see that big beautiful tornado rip apart a house. I love seeing destruction. I love the carnage that an F5 tornado can bring upon people. I like to show up to the sites where the tornado has destroyed. 
not to help save people, but to see the blood. One day, I'm out in my truck, around the area where I know a tornado will pass through, when I see a family bringing groceries into their house. I drive up to the house and strike a conversation with the dad, giving him a warning that a tornado should be coming today. The man asks me if I know where the tornado will be landing. I think any normal person would try to save lives and warn them to evacuate their house, but I lied and told them it will hit a town 20 miles away from them, so they shouldn't have anything to worry about. About an hour later, the tornado touches the ground. As I predicted, the beast starts heading the direction of the neighborhood where I had spoken to the man. I close my eyes and imagine the devastation that this tornado will bring to people, and I begin to get butterflies in my stomach. After some time, after the tornado is gone, I drive to that neighborhood, just as I thought. The neighborhood is in ruins. I get out of my truck and walk to the house of the family that I had spoken to. I begin lifting metal pipes and broken pieces of wood, and then I find them. They are all dead. Limbs are everywhere. Blood is everywhere. The wife's face is smashed in and her brains are seeping out of her ears. But then, I hear a quiet voice. The husband is still alive, stuck underneath their refrigerator. He looks up at me and extends his arm. Help me! Please help me! I silently look down at him for a few minutes. He stares back with confusion of why I'm not helping him. I then squat down next to him. I look deep into his eyes and smile. Then I stand up straight take a deep breath, turn and walk away. God, what a rush. The carnage was beautiful. I live in the countryside. I'm a 42 year old man, but at the time of this story, I was 39. Being that I live in the country, I have much land. I used to ride horses all the time on my property until an accident left me paralyzed from the waist down. At the time, my younger sister was staying with me to help me as my caretaker. During a day in November, I remember watching TV on the couch. My sister had to run to the store to pick up groceries for dinner. She had been gone for roughly 20 minutes when I noticed the weather had changed drastically and it began hailing outside. The TV started to get static on the screen. My animals were going crazy outside, and I pulled myself up to look out of the window. And there it was, a giant tornado right across my property, a few miles away. I instinctively went to grab my wheelchair, and then remembered that my sister moved it into a different room earlier when I was laying on the couch. The tornado was rapidly getting closer, so I threw myself off the couch and landed on the floor. I started dragging myself to the bathroom with all the strength that I had. With each painful pull, I could hear the thunderous tornado coming closer and closer. I was about 10 feet from the bathroom when I heard the barn being torn apart right next to my house. I finally made it into the bathroom and threw myself up and into the bathtub. The tornado ripped apart my house while I was quivering in the tub. I laid in the tub crying until my sister came home for what seemed like a year later. She ran into the bathroom and helped me out of the tub and into my chair. The tornado ripped off the side of my house, and the living room, where I just was, was gone. This story happened to my grandparents, but I've heard it so many times that I know what happened step by step. They were sleeping, and it was sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. They were woken up by the tornado warning that their small town had. My grandma was always the worry type, and grandpa was always the stubborn and brave one. My grandfather told my grandma to stay in the house while he was going to go outside and unlock the basement on the side of the house. While grandma was waiting, the house started shaking and the walls of the house were ripped apart. The next thing that happened was my grandma getting woken up by a firefighter. 
She was underneath a pile of rubble, and the firefighters were throwing things off of her to pull her out of the mess. Grandma just kept repeating, Where's my husband? Where's my husband? No one had an answer for her. A few days later, a police officer came into the hospital room to inform her that they found Grandpa. They found him a mile away from their house. Apparently, while Grandpa was outside unlocking the basement, the tornado sucked him up and launched him through the air. He died on impact when he smashed into the ground. I used to serve in the military when I was younger, and I've seen some horrible things, but this story is the worst thing I'd ever seen. I worked in a factory, and we deal with a bunch of highly combustible materials. It's very loud in the factory, with all the machinery running at the same time. One day I was at work, and everything was going like clockwork. Nothing unusual or different. When all of a sudden, the entire factory shuts down. It goes from unbelievably loud to silent. My supervisor comes running out of his office and screams, TORNADO! We all freak out and grab onto something sturdy. The whole factory begins to rumble and shake. I start praying and crying, and then the walls of the factory begin to rip off, and I can see the tornado from the opposite side of the building. I'm holding onto this pipe with dear life. I see some of my co-workers losing their grip and getting sucked into the tornado. The combustible materials are getting banged around and they start to explode. Other co-workers are engulfed in flames. I can see their skin melting off of their bones as they scream. Pipes from the factory are flying everywhere and I saw several men get impaled through their necks and legs and chest. It was a living nightmare. After only a few minutes, that seemed like an eternity, the tornado passes and I let go of the pipe that saved my life. The devastation was immense. There were 72 people working that day and six of us went home to our families. I had an amazing wedding with my new wife, but now the real fun begins, going on our honeymoon. My wife and I went to the Bahamas. We enjoyed going to the beach, the spas, the pools, the restaurants. It was all amazing. We went back to our room and made love and ordered room service. It only took 15 minutes for the room service to come, and when we opened the door, the man pushed the cart into our room. He looked at me and then looked back at my wife, who was in bed in her robe. He kept staring at her. I even stuck out my hand full of cash to tip the man, and he kept staring at my wife. I snapped my fingers and broke his eyesight. He grabbed the money and quickly left. My wife and I just laughed at each other. But later on in the night, around 11.30, we got a knock at our door. We weren't expecting anyone though. I opened the door. It was the room service guy again. He was just standing there, no food or anything. He said, did you order room service? We said no, and I shut the door. Ten minutes later, we heard a knock again. I yelled through the door, What, dude? He said in a monotone voice through the door, Did you order room service? And then very loudly, he started banging on the door non-stop and screaming over and over again, Room service! Room service! Room service! My wife was screaming, and I ran to the phone and called the lobby, and they sent security up, and they took the guy. But the scariest thing was that once the guy was removed, we found out that the man wasn't employed at the hotel, and he harmed the real room service man and took his uniform.
I met my wife in 2002. And we dated for six years and got married in 2010. My wife was my best friend, and I was the luckiest guy to watch her walk down that aisle towards me. After we were married, we left for our honeymoon to Cancun, Mexico. Cancun is known for its beautiful ocean view and stunning hotels. But there were two very important rules for visiting. One, don't drink water that isn't bottled sealed. And two, do not go swimming in the hotel pools after 9pm. Cancun had this 9pm rule because at night, alligators would sometimes find their way to the pools. We spent our first day at the ocean, hugging and kissing and enjoying our new titles as husband and wife. The second day was the fun time day, where we went to the club together and danced and ate great food and drank a lot of alcohol. The funny thing about Cancun is, you can drink and drink and drink, and you don't ever feel that drunk. But when the night came, I definitely felt the effect of the alcohol. My wife wasn't that drunk and found it funny that I couldn't handle my alcohol. So she and I stumbled back to our room and got into bed. Sadly, she tried to put the moves on me, but I was too drunk to do the deed, and I fell asleep. I woke up early that morning, around 4.45 a.m., and ran to the bathroom to throw up. When I was done ejecting the poison from my body, I turned around to see that my wife wasn't in bed. She wasn't anywhere in our room either. I wondered where she went. I slipped on my complimentary robe and slippers and went to the elevator to go down to the lobby. When the elevator doors opened, my eyes saw a bunch of blue and red flashing lights. Why are the police here? I walked to the receptionist and asked what was going on. She said apparently someone went swimming in the middle of the night and was attacked by an alligator. When I heard that, my heart immediately sunk to my stomach. I ran to the pool area. The pool was blocked by bodies of policemen and coroners and hotel managers. I pushed them aside to see past the yellow caution tape, and there was the alligator. Its head was split in two by a shotgun blast that was delivered by an officer. There was so much blood. But then, I saw the last thing I ever wanted to see. An arm, lying next to the alligator. It was my wife's arm. The police hadn't identified the body, but I knew it was her. I recognized the brand new wedding ring I had just put on her beautiful soft finger. When I was married to my first wife, we traveled to Hawaii for our honeymoon. We got to the island after a long flight and we were starving. We went to a local restaurant to eat and that's where we met this group of islanders who were eating at the table next to us. They asked us why we were visiting, and we told them we just got married. They thought it was wonderful, and offered us a discount rate to go parasailing. If you don't know what that is, it's where you go out on a boat, and you sit in the seat that's attached to a parachute, and the wind from the boat lifts you into the sky, and you sail in the air. We jumped on that offer, and the next day we met up with those men. Everything was fine. We went sailing for half an hour. We came back to the boat, ate a nice lunch, and then we went back to sailing. I noticed our parachute had a tear in it this time. I mentioned it to one of the guys, and they said it was fine. Not knowing much about this kind of thing, I just went with it. But as we were in the air this time, I thought I heard a ripping noise. I looked up at the parachute and I could visibly notice the tear was getting larger. I told my wife and she started freaking out. We both were screaming down to the boat and trying to get their attention, but they didn't notice us. Then all of a sudden, the parachute completely ripped and we started flying sideways. We were both screaming as we started flying straight down to the water. And then we smacked into the ocean. The boat circled around and grabbed me out of the water. My foot was broken. I yelled out, Where's my wife? The men were looking for my wife as the others were calling back to shore, but we couldn't see her. Time went by and no one ever found her. Her body never rose to the top of the water. 
nothing was ever found of my wife. My wife and I got engaged two months ago. We are a little older than most, in our 50s, and both of our parents had already passed away, so there was no need for a huge ceremony. We found online a great package deal for two to get married on a boat on the waters of Lake Tahoe in Nevada. We jumped on that deal and drove from Oregon to Lake Tahoe to get married and have our honeymoon there too. We got married on the boat and it was beautiful. While enjoying the rest of the time on the boat, the captain sat with us for a while and told us history about the lake. He even chuckled and said there's a cool ghost story and asked if we wanted to hear it. We laughed and said sure. He told us about a woman who was swimming one night after she'd been drinking at a party. She must have swam out too far and lost her strength while trying to swim back and unfortunately she drowned. Apparently, late at night, you can see her across the lake. We all laughed and went, ooh, spooky. Later that night, after we had gotten back to our hotel and washed up, we decided to have a candlelit picnic on the lake. We were enjoying champagne and seeing the moonlight reflect off the water. I remember that spooky story we heard, and I tried to play a trick on my wife. I said, look, babe, do you see that? I think I see a woman over there. My wife slapped my arm and told me to knock it off. I giggled like a schoolboy and went back to pouring my drink. My wife had to pee and went off to the restroom. While I was sitting there alone in the dark, I started thinking about the story and getting creeped out. As I was staring off into the lake, I heard this faint gurgling sound, almost like someone choking on water. I didn't know where it was coming from. Oh well, I thought. And I continued looking at the water. But then, I heard slow footsteps walking up to me. They weren't usually slow. I didn't bother to turn around because I knew it must be my wife trying to sneak up on me and scare me. And when the footsteps got to right behind me, they stopped. And then, I felt several water drops dripping on my back. I turned around. And there was a woman in a dress, pale, rotted skin with water dripping from her mouth and clothes. I jumped back and screamed, and then the woman took off running past me into the water. She sunk below the lake and didn't come back up. My wife came walking back, and I ran to her and told her what happened. My hands were shaking so hard. My wife thought I was playing another trick on her, and she laughed at me and never believed me. But to this day, I know what I saw. My wife and I are very big horror lovers. We love scary things. But after our honeymoon we had a few years ago, we absolutely do not love horror things anymore. We were small town people who didn't have much money. We got married in a courthouse, and we planned on having our honeymoon in Las Vegas. We live in California, so the drive to Vegas is far from a short drive. We left around 8 p.m. and planned on driving throughout the night. But around 3 a.m., we couldn't keep our eyes open anymore, so we stopped at a hotel in the middle of nowhere. We checked into our room and lay down in bed. As tired as I was, I couldn't sleep, so I laid there in the dark. But then I heard something from the room next to us. It was a loud bang, like someone kicking in the door. And then I heard screaming from a man and woman. My wife woke up, and I sat up in bed. I could hear grunts and moans, and then banging on the wall, like if someone was fighting someone and throwing themselves up against the wall. The screaming of the woman continued until I heard it go silent, and then the sound of gurgling and coughing. My mind instantly went to the thought of, did I seriously just hear someone get killed? I ran to grab my pants that were across the room that had my phone in the pocket. As I was trying to reach into my pocket, someone kicked our door very hard like they were trying to kick it in. 
My wife screamed and I threw my body up against the door. The person kept kicking it aggressively. I used all of my body weight to keep the door from breaking open. My wife grabbed my phone and called the police, and then the kicking abruptly stopped. I think the guy could hear my wife calling the police, and then I heard footsteps sprinting away from our door. I stayed against that door until the police arrived. I opened the door to talk to the police, and then my worst fear was made real. The cop told us to stay in our room, because the couple in the room next to us were stabbed repeatedly and blood was everywhere. I'm glad I couldn't sleep that night, because maybe that guy would have been able to break into our room and kill us too. It was definitely one hell of a start to a honeymoon. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, head over to my channel for part 2 of our collaboration. I hope to see you guys there. I had recently gotten married, and shortly after, my wife became pregnant. The nine months flew by. With the type of job I have, I am given up to 12 weeks of leave for bonding time with the baby. As the end of those short 12 weeks was up, I prepared myself to go back to work. The day came when I finally went back. I was greeted with a bunch of congratulations and handshakes. I carried my route that day. It took longer than I expected since I was a little rusty and out of practice, so I ended up being the last carrier to get back to the post office around 7pm. I brought all of my stuff in from my truck and put it away. The only people left at my office were me and the closing supervisor. I shouted to him that I was done putting everything away and I just needed to wash my hands and then I would be clocking out. I went into the bathroom located at the back of the building, but I was caught off guard when I went into the bathroom, because in there, washing his hands, was this guy Chuck. He used to be a carrier several years back, but he was promoted to safety manager. I hadn't seen him in a long time, but I remember he used to be a huge germ freak and was always washing his hands. I turned to him and say, Hey Chuck, how you doing? He didn't respond to me. I figured he didn't hear me, so I say again, What's up, Chuck? How are you? Still, he doesn't even look at me. Just continues to wash his hands. Normally, I would try to keep talking, but I was already into overtime and had to get off of the clock. I go to the time clock and swipe my time card. As I'm walking towards the front of the building to leave, I see my supervisor and say to him, Do you know who I just saw in the bathroom? My boss looks confused and says, Who? I said, Chuck, remember him? I wonder why he's here this late. My boss looks at me in a really creeped out way. He said, That's not possible. Chuck had a heart attack and died two months ago. Being a mailman, we are either hated or loved by people. There's hardly an in-between. But around the Christmas season, People are pretty generous towards us. We usually get gifts from our regular customers who we see on our routes. It can either be $10 in a card, or Mrs. Randall's homemade cookies, or even just a candy bar. But during the Christmas of 2007, I was doing my regular route. It was cold outside, and the grass was covered in brown and yellow leaves. It was Christmas Eve, and I had received a few gifts already. But as I approached this one street, I pretty much figured I wouldn't get a gift from this one certain customer. He was always calling and complaining about me for whatever reason he made up. As a mailman, we are supposed to always be polite to our customers, even if they don't deserve it. So I always tried to kill this man with kindness. But when I got a few houses before his house, I noticed him standing outside. I thought to myself, great. What is he going to say to me this time? I'm walking to his house, and I notice he's smiling and holding something. I say hello to him and offer a Merry Christmas Eve greeting. He holds out something in front of him. It's a batch of brownies. I'm confused. This guy hates me. Why would he have brownies for me? 
The guy says he knows he's been a pain in the butt and wants to apologize. And as a way for him to make it up, he baked brownies for me. I thought that was really nice of him. I politely accepted the brownies and thanked him. When I finished my street, I sat in my truck and unwrapped the brownies. I threw one in my mouth. They were bite-sized, so they were easy to eat really fast. They had a weird taste to them, though, but I thought it may have been from the taste of the saran wrap. I drive to my next street and begin delivery. My stomach starts feeling weird as I'm walking. Every step I'm taking feels heavier. My breath is getting shorter. A customer notices me from her window. I'm starting to drag my feet and get dizzy. She runs out to me and asks if I'm okay. I go to say that something is wrong, but my words don't come out. Instead, when I open my mouth, a long stream of blood squirts out from my throat. I fall to my knees and look up at this woman, and she has this look of fear as she tells me she is going to call an ambulance. I fall to my side and begin to shake. I can hear the woman on the phone with the dispatcher. She is yelling, and I hear her say something worse than I imagined. She says, My mailman has collapsed, and he is bleeding from his eyes and ears and mouth. His skin is green, and his lips are purple. The ambulance arrives in a few minutes, and they immediately start pumping my stomach. They pump me full of electrolytes and fluids until I come to. I was able to say I ate brownies that a customer gave me. They went back and examined the rest of the brownies to determine that the man had poisoned the brownies with rat poisoning. It's no secret that mailmen and dogs are not fond of one another. One of the most important aspects of the job is to be aware of dogs. I've been on my route for six years, so I know where all of the dogs are on my route. And every day that I do my route, 1340 Ensignal Drive has their pit bull outside. It constantly barks at me and seems like it wants to rip me apart. I usually have to throw their mail over the fence so I don't get bit. The owners usually see me do this. They're so annoying because as I walk by, him and his wife are always laughing and they say to me, Do you want to pet my dog? Like it's a joke or something. This goes on every day except on this one day. I get to the street and usually can already hear their stupid dog barking from 10 houses down, but this time it's silent. I approach the house and see no dog. This is weird because for the last six years, this dog has been out every single day. I open the gate quietly and cautiously walk across the yard. I'm looking all around to see if the dog is hiding somewhere, but he's nowhere to be found. I put the mail in the box by the door. As I'm about to turn to leave, I see something through the window. I can't really tell what it is, so I look a little closer. I drop my mail when I see what it is. It's the dog. It's hanging by its leash from the ceiling fan in the living room. It's sliced open from chest to the legs. Its intestines are hanging out from its stomach and piled on the ground below it. I turn around to run back to my truck, and I stop in my tracks. Standing behind me is the husband and wife. They're holding knives, and their hands and clothes are covered in blood. They take a step towards me when I shout out, What do you want? The husband looks at his wife, and they both start laughing hysterically. Then the man turns his head at me and says, Do you want to pet my dog? We offer many services in the post office. We know it can be a pain in the butt to stand in line to ship packages, so we have made it easier on the customers and started a service where you can send a package right from your doorstep. We pick it up for you and send it off. It's very convenient for the customer, but not always convenient for us mailmen, because sometimes customers want to have a conversation with us as they are giving us their packages. One morning, as I'm getting my route ready, I get a paper informing me that there's a package pickup at 2524 50th Avenue. I recognize that address. The customer's names are Todd and Stephanie. They are boyfriend and girlfriend. 
I talk to them all the time when I'm delivering. Their house is in the beginning of my route. They are a very cute couple. They have been living at that house for almost a year. They always greet me at the door, and their cat always runs out and rubs against my legs. The cat's name is Rubio. I get to their house around 9am and knock on the door. Todd opens the door and he isn't in the same friendly mood he usually is in. I say, hey Todd, how are ya? He says he's not doing so well. Him and Stephanie broke up and she moved to her mom's house a few towns away. I tell him, I'm sorry to hear that. He kind of shakes it off and says, well, here's the package. He keeps stressing to me about how he doesn't want me to lose this package because it's for Stephanie and it's important that she gets it. I tell him I'll take good care of it and make sure she receives it. I put the package in the back of my truck and proceed to carry on delivery of my route. It's about 1 p.m. now and every time I get into my truck, it smells really bad. I thought maybe my sandwich was spoiling in my hot truck, so I checked it but it was fine. I don't know where this smell is coming from. I have a few streets left on my route at this point, and I can't take the smell anymore. I open the back of my truck and notice that the package that Todd gave me seems to be leaking some red fluid. As mailmen, we have the right to open people's packages for safety reasons, so I inform my supervisor that this package is leaking and I'm going to open it. I get the okay and I split the tape. This horrible stench seeps out of the package when I do that. I put on my gloves and open the cardboard flaps. I let out a deep breath of disgust when I see what's inside the package. Inside was the mangled body of Rubio. Its heart was cut out of the cat and placed next to Rubio. Inside was a note from Todd. It read, I ripped out his heart, the same way you ripped out mine, Stephanie. I alerted my supervisor and the police were called. Todd was arrested for animal abuse. And there's only one thing I can say for sure. I made sure that Stephanie did not receive this package. I am a postal service city carrier. I take my job very seriously, and I am the safety captain. I work in a pretty bad neighborhood. I wish I didn't, but I do. I'm delivering my route one day when I have a package for a known drug house. I'm a little weary of this house. There's always questionable druggy people standing out front. I notice this package I have smells like marijuana. Being the safety captain, it's my responsibility to maintain security of the mail. I decide I'm going to bring this package back and not deliver it. As I put this package back in my truck, I'm approached by these three men. I get a little nervous because we don't carry any sort of protection. The men tell me they are expecting an important package. I tell them I don't have it, but they aren't buying it. They start getting loud with me. I tell them to step back or I'm calling the cops. This seemed to work because they backed off after. I get in my truck and drive away, but as I'm doing my route, I notice one of the guys is following me. He keeps his distance, but he stands at the end of every street I deliver, just watching me. We deal with a lot of druggies, so I tend to ignore them. They are usually harmless. I finish my route around 6.30 p.m. and head back to the station. I put everything away and clock out at 7 p.m. I leave the front of the post office and as I'm walking to my car, I see the man from across the parking lot. He followed me back to my job. Thankfully, he did not approach me. I get in my car and drive home. I walk through the door around 7.45 and greet my wife and my two-month-old baby. We eat dinner and then go to sleep. In the middle of the night, I wake up to hear my baby crying. I get out of bed and stumble out into the kitchen to make my baby a bottle. As I look out of the window above the sink in the kitchen, I see the man. He is standing in my front yard. 
I run into my room to call the police. My wife wakes up and is confused to what's going on. I tell her there's a man who followed me home. Go into the nursery and get the baby. As I'm on the phone with the police, I hear my wife scream. She yells my name and I run into the nursery. The man crawled through the window and was holding my baby. He had a gun pointed at us. I tried to calm the man down and stall him until the cops came. Fortunately, within minutes I could hear the sirens approaching. The man heard it too, and he dropped my baby on the floor. He jumped out of the window, and I grabbed my baby. The cops found the guy two blocks away and arrested him. We took our baby to the emergency room, and thankfully there were no injuries to the baby's head or body. After that, we put locks on our doors and bars on the windows. Back in 2008, my husband and I owned a beautiful four-bedroom and two-story house, but the housing market crash left us broke and forced us to move out. We didn't have the same kind of money we had when we first moved into our house, so we were forced to drastically downscale our lives and move into a not-so-new house. Don't get me wrong, the house we found wasn't horrible, but there definitely were a few things wrong with it. It was an older house. The outside of it looked like it was never repainted. The walls had a yellowish tint to them from the prior homeowners smoking cigarettes inside and the air conditioner needed to be fixed. But honestly, that was simply all we could afford. The first night we lived there, we were both in bed and I could hear something. It kind of sounded like scratching in the walls, but it was so faint that I wasn't really sure even I heard anything at all. I just ignored it and went back to bed. The next day, I was eating breakfast at the table, and I heard it again. I went to investigate the noises. I went outside and noticed a tree on the side of our house was smacking against the house from the windy day that it was. Yet, it wasn't the same type of scratching, but I figured that must be what it was. That night, I was in bed again with my husband. I heard the scratching again. I woke my husband up and asked him what that was. My husband is not a night guy. He gets very annoyed when he gets woken up. So he grunted and said, uh, I don't know. I'll figure it out tomorrow. I said, okay, and went to sleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to a pain on my torso. I opened my eyes and screamed louder than I have ever screamed before. My husband jumped up to see what I had seen. I was covered in rats. They were crawling on my body and all in my bed. We both jumped up screaming. We ran out of the room and into the living room. It was 2 a.m. so no exterminators were open. We waited till morning and then we called them. I must have taken three showers back to back that night. And now when I'm sleeping, I'll sometimes burst awake screaming, feeling like I'm covered in rats. My wife and son and I moved into this house back in 2006. It was a cute little home, kind of a fixer-upper, but we ultimately liked it. We had never owned a home before. The first few nights of us living there, everything was normal. But then one morning, my wife and I woke up to the loud sound of buzzing. We were shocked to find that in the living room, one of the walls was completely covered in flies. Flies have never bothered me, but seeing that many made me sick to my stomach. There must have been a thousand flies. My wife went to the kitchen and pulled out some cleaning supplies to spray the flies and kill them. Once we killed the flies, we scrubbed the wall, and that was it, until we woke up the next morning. We heard that buzzing noise again. We looked at each other in disbelief that there would be flies again. We went out into the living room, and the same wall was covered in flies once again. We sprayed the flies, 
and my wife got back to scrubbing the walls. But this time, she scrubbed so hard that the paint started wearing off. And that's when we noticed some sort of red paint under the white paint. So I jumped in and we both started scrubbing the walls aggressively. After 30 minutes of scrubbing, my wife and I froze. My wife dropped her scrub brush. We both slowly took steps backwards to see that under the paint was a huge painted satanic symbol. I had moved into a duplex with my dog Tyrion. I don't have a girlfriend or a family, so I only needed a small duplex for me and a small backyard for Tyrion to run around. I'm very close to my dog. I've had him for six years now. I treat him like he's my son. I buy him expensive dog food and a ton of toys. The only problem is that he buries all of his toys and then forgets where he buries them, so I constantly have to buy him more. Sometimes I'll look outside and see him digging in the yard, trying to find his toys he buried. So one evening during the summer, I came home from the store and bought Tyrion a new squeaky ball toy. He went wild over it. I loved that. I open up the back sliding door and let him take his toy into the backyard. I go sit on my couch and watch TV. I look over at Tyrion time to time and see him in the backyard digging. I kind of chuckle to myself. I'm in the middle of a show when I feel a nudge on my arm. I look over and Tyrion is holding something that's completely covered in dirt. I get up and take it from him because he's getting dirt all over the carpet. I took it over to the sink to wash it off for him. As I'm washing it, I'm starting to realize that I'm not washing off a toy that I bought him. I scrape a little more dirt off, and then I gasp and drop the item as I back away. What I was holding was a human skull that Tyrion dug up. I have a big family, a wife and four kids, three boys, one girl. Our baby girl was born a few months ago. We lived in a nice apartment, but needed to upgrade to a house for space. We house searched for a while until we came across this beautiful home for a ridiculously cheap price. We asked our realtor what the catch was. Why was it so cheap? She said that the last few families experienced weird things happening and they all moved out. And since then, no one wanted to move in. I'm not a man of superstition, so I jumped on this deal and moved my family in. And almost immediately, things started happening. Even on moving day, we had boxes stacked on boxes and randomly, the boxes would fall onto the floor. Weird, yes, but simple explanation. The boxes just fell from the weight. Within that week, we would wake up from hearing things banging around in the kitchen, but all the kids were asleep. But then things started getting really weird. Our oldest son woke us up one night and said there's something watching him sleep in the shadows of his room. We investigated, but found nothing. We let him sleep in our bed for the next few days, until our youngest son, who shared a room with the baby, came running into our room. He said he woke up and something was holding our baby. We ran into his room to find our baby on the floor behind the door in the shadows. That was almost enough for us to not want to live there. But the final straw was when the following night we saw something that was completely unexplainable. We saw in our room footprints leading up to our bed where we had the kids sleeping with us. The footprints started from behind the door up to our bed and then the footprints turned and walked towards the wall and then up the wall and onto the ceiling and back to the shadow behind the door. We moved our family out the next day. I am a nurse, so I make a good amount of money. I'm single, 
and only needed a small house to move into. I found a cute little house, and it was in a pretty nice neighborhood, so I moved in. I loved the area. People actually brought me welcome to the neighborhood food. Almost everyone except the neighbor to my left. He also lived alone. I didn't really think much of him until I started noticing things about him. It seemed like every time I took the trash out, he took it out at the same exact time. Maybe it was a coincidence. But also, every time I left to go anywhere, he'd be going to his car the same time I was going to mine. Every time I did yard work, he was doing yard work. It made me feel really uncomfortable. I was starting to get paranoid and think maybe he was possibly spying on me, watching every move I made. I felt like maybe I needed to test it out to see if that was the case. So I casually grabbed my purse one afternoon, grabbed the car keys, and headed to the car. Sure enough, he left his house and started heading to his car too. But then I pretended like I forgot something and went back inside. And sure enough, he went back into his house. Now I knew he was somehow watching me. I had to learn more. So a few days later, I did the routine again, grabbed my purse and keys and headed to the car. And there he was, no surprise. I then got in my car and started driving away. But once I turned the corner, I gunned it and then parked in a hidden location. I slumped into my seat and waited until I saw him drive past my car. I then turned around and drove home in a hurry. I got out of the car and hopped the fence into his backyard. I went to the back sliding door and it was unlocked, so I went into his house. I walked through his house so scared of him coming home, but then I found his bedroom. In his bedroom, he had a computer monitor turned on. I walked up to it and saw what I was fearing the most. He had four cameras, all pointed at different parts of my house. He could completely see into my entire house. He was watching every move I made. I didn't call the police because I was scared they would know that I broke into this guy's house, but I did confront the guy with a few of the male neighbors in the neighborhood. We told him to pack his stuff and move out, or we would call the police. He did eventually move after that, but I still feel like I'm being watched at all times. When I was in fifth grade, I spent the night at my friend Sarah's house. We were very good friends ever since kindergarten. Sarah always slept at my house whenever we had sleepovers. And for some reason, Sarah never wanted me to sleep at her house. But finally she gave in and let me come over. My mom dropped me off at Sarah's house. We put all of my stuff in Sarah's room and started doing the normal girl thing. We played with her dolls and talked about the cute boys in our class. Sarah lived alone with her dad. Her mom took off when Sarah was two, so I figured maybe she was embarrassed of that and that's why I was never allowed to stay over. Because up until now everything was fine. Sarah's dad ordered us pizza and then told us lights out by 10 p.m. So when 10 p.m. rolled around, we made a bed on the floor of Sarah's room and got under the blankets and went to sleep. At some point in the night, I woke up for whatever reason, and then I looked over and saw Sarah's dad standing in the door for him. He was in his tidy whitey underwear, only looking down at me. He had this weird look on his face as he was also drinking a beer. He kind of moaned a little and then turned and walked away. I got really scared and turned back to my friend and closed my eyes. The next day I called my mom and she picked me up in the morning. She asked if I had fun and I told her what happened. My mom freaked out. She went home and jumped on the computer and researched the guy. Apparently, he was a sex offender. I won't get into details, but all you need to know is that I'm lucky that him staring at me was as far as it went. Now I know why no one was ever allowed to stay at Sarah's house. I had just turned eight. I invited all of my classmates over for my birthday party. 
My dad greeted each parent and child as they showed up and dropped off their kid. After we played games and ate cake and opened gifts, it was time for all of the girls to go home and the rest of the boys were staying the night. We watched scary movies and ate popcorn and did typical boy stuff before we started falling asleep one by one. The next morning, as my friend's parents were picking them up, my dad was greeting them again and saying thanks for coming. And then this guy walked up to our house and said hi and that he was here to pick up my friend Jacob. My dad asked who he was because he wasn't the person who dropped Jacob off. The guy said he was a friend of Jacob's dad and the dad had to work so he sent me to pick up Jacob. Something didn't sit right with my dad and I could tell. He said I'm going to have to call and make sure Jake's parents know about this. The guy got mad and said, what you think I'm lying? My dad got mad back and told him to wait outside as he was going to call Jacob's dad. My dad shut the door and called Jacob's father. My dad said, hey there's this guy with a goatee and hoop earring here to pick up Jacob and he said that you were at work? I could hear on the other line Jake's dad screaming and saying no I'm at home. That's my neighbor. Don't let him touch my son. My dad hung up the phone and ran back to the door to confront the guy, but he was gone when my dad opened the door. I never found out what happened after Jake's dad came and picked him up, but I don't want to know. I was 11 when my buddy Aaron slipped over at my house. I remember my mom rented Buffy the Vampire Slayer from Blockbuster and ordered a pizza for us. My mom and dad went to bed and told us to lock the front door before we fall asleep. We made our fort in the living room and just about finished the movie as I was falling asleep. Aaron woke me back up and reminded me to lock the door. I got up and I locked it and went back to lay down, but getting up and locking the door gave me another burst of energy, so we turned on my Nintendo 64 and started playing Mario Kart. In the middle of a race, Aaron said he thought he heard something outside. I brushed it off and kept playing the game, and then a minute later, he said he heard it again. So I paused the game, and we both got quiet to listen, and as we were both looking at the front door, we saw the doorknob start turning slowly. Aaron instantly started crying and saying over and over again, We're gonna die. We're gonna die. Oh my god, we're gonna die. I told him to be quiet, and I ran to my parents' room and woke my dad up. I told my dad what was happening, and he jumped up and threw his pants and shoes on and ran to the front door. My dad unlocked it and ripped the door open and could see a man running away from our house. My dad chased after him for a block or two, but eventually, the man outran my dad. My dad called the police, but they basically said there was nothing they can do. Aaron's parents were called, and he got picked up, and I'm so glad that Aaron reminded me to lock the front door. In my early 20s, I'll admit that I shouldn't have been doing some of the things that I was doing. I was very deep into drugs, and it wasn't uncommon to have random friends of mine staying over at my apartment. One night, late at night, around 9.30, a knock was on my door. It was my friend Toby. He was strung out, asked if he could crash at my place. I said yeah. We sat in my living room and started talking. He was crying and very upset. I guess somebody robbed him and took all of his money. I felt so bad. I lit up the meth pipe and offered him a hit. We both got very high that night. I told him he could crash on the couch, but I was going to go to my room to go to sleep. In the middle of the night, I could hear him crying. I tried to ignore it, but he didn't stop. I finally got up to see what was going on. I walked out to find him with a pistol up to his temple. I said, Toby, whoa, relax, dude. He kept crying and yelling that he had nothing to live for. I tried calming him down, but in the middle of my speech to try and calm him down, he pulled the trigger. Brains covered my wall. I was in shock and tripping balls from the meth too. I do not let anyone sleep over anymore after seeing that. We all know the rules for staying the night at someone's house when you were a kid. 
Don't fall asleep first, because everyone else will mess with you. But this sleepover went horribly wrong. Four of us were sleeping at my house during summer break from 5th grade to 6th grade. We were all up really late because no one wanted to fall asleep first. But eventually, our friend Zach crashed out. The three of us were giggling and discussing how we should mess with him. One kid said to put his hand in warm water. I said, let's draw penises on his face. But our other friend Ryan said, let's take a can of deodorant spray and a lighter and blow torch his leg hairs a little bit. Being young boys, that sounded hilarious. So we got the supplies and started lighting Zach's leg hair on fire. We all were trying to hold back our laughter. Zach kept sleeping through it, didn't even notice. And then Ryan said, this is boring. Let's try his hair on his head. We were unsure of doing that. Head hair is a little bit different than leg hair. But being so young, bad ideas sometimes sound good. So we held the can of spray next to his head, lit the lighter, and pushed on the spray can nozzle. The flames instantly caught all of his hair on fire. Zack woke up and screamed as his entire head was engulfed in flames. All of us were screaming too. My parents ran out and saw what was happening and ran to the kitchen to get water. They poured it on his head and put the flames out. 911 was called and Zach was treated for his burns. We never thought his hair would catch on fire, but it did. And I'll never forget the smell of the skin on his head melting down to the skull. My wife and I have always celebrated Thanksgiving with my side of the family, mainly because my family lives near us and my wife's side lives a few hours away. But this year was the first year that we were going to be visiting them. We put our son into his car seat and we hit the road. On the drive, I'm asking my wife to tell me about each of her family members. She says the same thing that everyone says that they are a little crazy. I ask who the craziest person is. She tells me her uncle is. When I ask why, she doesn't really have a clear answer. She just says something about how there were always rumors about him being weird with kids, but she never knew anything more than that. After a few hours, we arrive to the house. The family greets us at the door and I start introducing myself and my son to everyone. And then I meet the uncle. I imagined a creepy looking man, but he looked normal. He was very nice and sweet. He didn't seem weird to me. We converse for a while and the family all sits down to eat. After the food, we all sit down to play a board game. I'm having a great time. Then I notice my son's diaper is full. I get up and I grab the diaper bag. I announce across the room to my wife that I'm taking my son to the back room where all the other kids are to change his diaper. I take my son's hand and we go into the room. I lay him down on his back and get out a clean diaper and wipes. I take off my son's diaper and turn to grab a wipe and then out of the corner of my eye I see something. The uncle is standing in the doorway. He is staring down at my son's exposed private area. I don't want to make a scene since I don't really know her family very well. So I wait about 30 seconds for him to leave, but he doesn't. At this point, I realize he isn't going to leave. So I turn my body to cut off sight from him and my son. At this point, he walks around me and acts like he is looking for something in the room. And then I see his head turn and his eyes focus on my son's privates. And once he looks, he immediately walks out of the room. I sit there silently for a minute, shaking and trying to comprehend what I just saw. I finish the diaper change and walk back into the living room. I pull my wife to the side and tell her we need to leave right now. 
We get back into the car and start driving home when I tell her what happened. My wife freaks out. She calls her father the next day and tells him what happened too. He was furious. And from that point on, her uncle was never allowed around the family again. My name is Aaron. I'm 31 and I'm married with two kids. This year has been hard on me and my family. My father passed away earlier this year in March. My mom took the loss very hard. They were married for 23 years. I have my own house, but my little 17-year-old brother Jake lives at home with my mom still. This was the first Thanksgiving we were going to have without dad. It was going to be hard, but we would manage. I arrived with my family early in the morning at my mom's house. We prepared the turkey and the other side dishes. And throughout the day, I saw my brother Jake walking around. I tried to engage in conversation with Jake, but he was acting kind of odd. I didn't want to push him into talking, so I left it alone. The food was finally ready, and we gathered around the table to eat. We were all sharing stories of Dad and memories of other Thanksgivings with him. We were all laughing and smiling, except Jake. He barely ate. He more so just pushed food around his plate with his fork. I asked him if he was okay, and he ignored me. I asked again, and he looked at me, but said nothing. He seemed like he was in deep thought about something. Dinner was great, and we all finished and started cleaning. Jake didn't help. He went to his room instead. After cleaning, my wife packed up the kids, and I said goodbye to my mother. We got in the car, and began driving home on our 45-minute drive. About 30 minutes into the drive, my wife realized she forgot her purse. We had to go back, because her wallet was in there. The kids were getting restless in the back, so I told her to stay in the car when we got there. I pulled up to my mom's house, again, and jumped out of the car. I opened the front door and yelled out to my mom that we forgot the purse, but it was dead silent in the house. I yelled out, hello? But nothing was said back, and then I heard a sound coming from my mom's room. I walked down the hall to her room and opened the door, and then I saw the most horrifying sight. My brother Jake was sitting over my mom, and he was holding a knife that was dripping blood. My mom was lying lifeless underneath Jake. Her throat was slit from ear to ear. This story takes place on Thanksgiving Day in the late 1960s. Charles Manson was a huge topic during this time. He led a cult of people to do horrible things to others. So a lot of our town was scared that this could happen to us. One day, I ended up meeting this guy. We started dating shortly after, and it was going pretty well. He invited me to join him and his family for Thanksgiving dinner. I had moved to this area by myself, so I had no family to see on that day. So I agreed. My boyfriend picked me up Thanksgiving afternoon, and we began the drive to meet his family. I'm asking him questions about his parents and his siblings, but he isn't telling me much. He is being very vague about the information he tells me. I was a little bit put off by this, but I figured maybe he was slightly embarrassed by them, and that's why he didn't say much. We get to the house around 2 p.m., and walk into the house. The first thing I noticed was that the family seemed overly nice, like they were putting on a front or something. Overall, I didn't know these people. Maybe they actually were super nice, so I just went with it. We sat down and ate dinner around 5 p.m. I remember the food being a little dry, but no big deal. But during dinner, my boyfriend's parents were asking me some really weird questions about myself. 
super weird things about do I believe in the devil and God? Do I feel like I'm a pure hearted person? Weird things like that. I just answered with short responses. When our awkward family dinner was over, I told my boyfriend I was ready to go home. He begged me to stay longer. He said his family wanted to do something really special since I was his new girlfriend. I didn't want to sound rude, so I said okay. His family was thrilled when I said we were going to stay longer. Then they said they were all going to go to their rooms to change out of their nice Thanksgiving clothes and to have a seat and they would be right back. They went into their bedrooms. Several minutes later, their doors opened. I got very nervous when they all walked out at the same time and they were all dressed in pure white clothes. They all had a very large smile on their faces as they stared at me. I looked at my boyfriend and whispered to him, let's go. He said okay and then he walked to the front door. He put his hand up to the knob to open it, but he didn't open it. Instead, he locked the deadbolt and slowly turned his head at me with the same creepy smile the others had. Right then I knew something was seriously twisted about these people. I looked left and right for an exit, but saw nowhere to run. I backed up into the wall and begged them to please let me go, and then all at once they started shaking their heads left and right, silently telling me, no. I screamed at the top of my lungs. I screamed help louder than I thought my voice could ever go. And right then, the mom ran to the kitchen and grabbed a long knife. She started laughing and slowly walking towards me. I tried to run away, but the dad grabbed me and restrained me by the arms. I just kept screaming. Then the mom ran up to me and stopped, right in her tracks about a foot away. She hunched over a little bit, and then she drove the knife into my stomach. I screamed again and again, please stop. She pulled the knife out of me. I saw her hand the knife to one of the siblings. He stepped up next and cocked his hand back to stab me again. And then two loud bangs came from the front door. Suddenly the door breaks open and a man is standing there with two police officers. The police shoot the brother and he drops the knife. They pry me from the dad's arms and rush me to the police car. An ambulance comes and rushes me to the hospital where they save my life. When I finally came to, I was in the hospital. I see an officer and ask him what happened. He told me a man was walking his dog when he heard screaming coming from inside the house. He called the cops. I never found out who that random guy was, but he ultimately saved my life from this psychotic cult of a family. I met this guy on a dating website several years back. He seemed charming. He was cute. We seemed to click right off the bat. I'm not a stupid person who meets guys in person immediately. I usually make the guy wait a few weeks before actually meeting. So several weeks passed and I started to get very interested in him. Eventually, he asked if we could meet. I felt like I could trust him enough to feel safe. I asked him where he wanted to meet. He told me normally he would want to meet in public. But Thanksgiving was a few days away, and he invited me over to join him for dinner. I was a little hesitant, but I ultimately decided to join him. Thanksgiving rolled around, and I got to his house around 7pm. It was already dark outside, and as I walked up the driveway, I noticed most of the lights were off inside. I knocked at the door, and I could hear some shuffling from inside. I knocked again. And that's when I heard him from inside say, Come on in, it's open. I slowly turned the doorknob and walked into the house. Something didn't seem right when I walked in. There was no smell of Thanksgiving food. I said, hello? But he didn't respond. I got this bad feeling. Like I had made a mistake going there. I decided to leave and walk to the door. 
Right before I touched the handle to leave, I got hit in the head with something. I fell to my hands and feet. I turned my head and looked up and saw the man standing over me. My head was bleeding and my ears were ringing. I saw him walk across the room and to the table. He grabbed a roll of duct tape and started marching towards me. He bent down and grabbed me by the hair. He bent down and whispered in my ear, Happy Thanksgiving. Right then, I stuck my hand in my purse, pulled out a taser, and stuck it on the side of his head and tased him. His body started flopping around like a fish out of water. It gave me enough time to stumble my way out of his house and back to my car. I started the car and drove away and called the cops. I got medical treatment and the man was arrested. That was a Thanksgiving that I'll never forget. The story I'm about to tell is a true story. A tale that happened to me and my friends and my husband, although at the time we were just friends. This happened Thanksgiving of 1992. My husband and myself didn't have any family. That was one of the reasons we bonded so well. So we had nobody to spend Thanksgiving with. So him and myself met up with two of our friends. We went riding around the country roads of our somewhat small eastern Texas town. That's one of the only things that we had to do to pass the time back in the 90s. The road we were on has three different churches on a curve. An Assembly of God, a Baptist, and a Methodist church. As we came to about a hundred feet away from two of the churches, my husband and I see a figure walking from the Baptist church parking lot heading towards the Methodist church. As the headlights hit the figure, we noticed that it was tall, slim, red, and had a humanoid face with horns on its forehead and a long tail. It turned its head. It looked at me and my husband, then turned its head back. As soon as its feet touched the Methodist grounds, it disappeared. My husband and I looked at each other in horrified disbelief. We both said, did we really just see a demon? We asked our friends if they saw what we did. At first they looked at us in confusion and replied, no, we didn't see anything. When we told them what we saw, they didn't believe us. But when they saw our faces and how badly we were shaken up, they believed we weren't lying. It's been 25 years since that Thanksgiving night and it still makes me nervous. In my mind, it will be forever known as the Thanksgiving I'll never forget. Back in 1998, before iPhones and GPS, I was taking a drive from Sacramento, California to Carson City, Nevada. The drive was only about three hours and I was driving by myself to visit my girlfriend who had recently moved there for work. This was my first time taking the drive up there. All I had was a piece of paper with handwritten directions on it. It was around 8 p.m. when I left. Normally, I don't like driving at night, but I had to work till 6 and then I went home and showered first before I left. Now I'm on my way to Nevada. The drive is going smooth so far. Turn by turn, I scratch off the next direction written on my paper. It's about 10.15 now, and the only thing keeping me motivated to keep driving is the thought of being with my girlfriend. My mind starts wandering off somewhere as I'm thinking of her, and then I realize that I missed a turn. I flip the car around and start heading back that direction, but now everything seems so foreign to me. I don't recognize anything. I come up to a street sign that kind of sounds familiar, so I took a chance and turned down that road. I knew almost instantly that I had made a bad move turning here. The road went from pavement to dirt. It led me to nowhere. By this time, I had been turning wrong directions for an hour. 
It's about 11.30 now, and I have no idea where I am. I decide to park my car and sleep in it for the night, and try to find my way when the sun comes up. It's snowing outside now, and I'm trying to cuddle up with my duffel bag that I packed. But then I see something. It's pitch black outside, but I can see a dark silhouette of a man outside my car. It was standing in one spot. I couldn't tell if it was looking at me or not. I was getting scared, but also nervous because I felt like maybe I should ask if they know the way back to the main road. I decided that I need to ask. I roll down my window and shout out, Excuse me? The second that I say that, the thing takes off running into the bushes. That was really weird. I roll the window back up. It's so quiet outside. No sounds, or cars, or airplanes, or anything. Just pure silence. Something inside me was very uneasy. I felt like whatever I saw was still around. I couldn't relax until I knew it was gone, so I throw on a jacket, open my car door, and get out. I crawl out of my car. It's freezing outside. I'm looking off into the darkness. My eyes are hurting from how hard I'm squinting my lids to see farther. As I'm looking, I start hearing this heavy breathing. My heart starts pounding. The breathing is coming from behind me. I slowly turn around, and then I see it. That thing from earlier is on top of my car, staring at me. Its eyes were glowing red, their saliva dripping from its mouth. It has the body of a man, but the face of a demon. I jump back into my car, attempt to start it as urine is streaming down my leg. I finally steady my hand enough to insert the key. I start the car and pill out down the road. I continue to look back, but the thing is not following me. I eventually drove enough to where I found the main road. I sped to my girlfriend's house and got there around 3 a.m. I banged on her door until she opened it. I told her what happened, but she didn't believe me. No one I ever told believed me. But I know what I saw. I'll never forget those red, glowing eyes. When I turned 16, my father was pretty pushy about me getting my license. He was always the type of guy who said you need to take care of your business. He was a pretty old-fashioned man. He didn't agree with technology. He didn't believe in GPS. He felt that a real girl should know how to read a map and figure out direction based off of where the sun was. So a few months after my 16th birthday, my father handed me the keys to his Volvo. I was freshly licensed and ready to hit the road by myself finally. I gave my dad a hug and told him I loved him. I started heading to the front door when my dad let out a loud, clearing the throat noise. <clears throat> I stopped and looked back to see my dad's hand was out. He mumbled out, Your phone, please. He wanted me to take a map and drive 30 minutes east, make three right turns at very specific roads and two left turns, and end up at a diner and wait for him to show up shortly after. This was his test to see how well I would do without my phone. So I start driving out of town. 30 minutes goes by, and I see the first road that I need to turn on. I turn on it. A few minutes later, I see the second road, but it's blocked off for some reason. It's forcing me to take a different route. My dad never mentioned that the street would be blocked. I look at my map and figure out a new road to take. I make a U-turn and go down this different path. As I'm driving, the sun is setting. The street signs are getting very difficult to see. I pull over and look at my map. I didn't recognize where I was. I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. I start to panic as it is only me on this back road. And then I notice something. There's a car following me down this dirt road. 
Its headlights are very bright. I get a little worried about this car. I'm only a small 16-year-old girl. I can't defend myself. I put the car into drive and start driving away from this vehicle. I pick up the speed, and I notice this car is doing the same. I try to park in a turnout part of the street and let this car pass, but it doesn't. It pulls up right behind me. I'm terrified. I hit the gas again, and now I'm being completely chased by this car. The only thing I could see was those glaring headlights right behind me. I'm starting to envision myself being murdered by this person in the middle of a dark dirt road. I start crying and screaming, leave me alone, and then I remember that my dad always kept a wood bat in the back seat. I stick my arm in the back while trying to keep my eyes focused on the road, and then I feel the bat. I realize at this moment that I need to defend myself from this car. I skid off of the road and put the car in park. The car behind me stops behind my car only just 50 feet back. I take the bat and hold it like I'm going to swing for a home run. I scream as I run up on this guy as he's getting out of his vehicle. I swing the bat and deliver a fatal blow to this guy's head. I can't see anything because it's so dark, but I can feel the blood from this guy's head running down the road and over my toes in the sandals that I'm wearing. I step over this guy to go into his car to find his phone to call the police. I see his phone sitting on the seat. I'm having an anxiety attack as I'm reaching for his phone. I pick it up and unlock the screen. I'm confused as I'm realizing that his phone has the same background picture as my phone does. Then I realize the phone has the same apps that my phone does. I'm starting to realize that this is my phone. And then I realize that I recognize this car. I say out loud, oh my god. I turn on the flashlight on the phone and point it down at this man. It's my dad. He must have been following me in case I got lost. I break down crying when it all hits me. I killed my dad with his own baseball bat. One day during the summer, I'm heading through the country at night to go to a friend's house for his birthday party. I've never been there before, so I'm a little lost trying to find the house. His address is 2214 Lake Way. I come up to the area where I'm supposed to be turning on this street, but the road sign was vandalized with graffiti and I can't really read the street name, so I figured I'd turn down the street anyways and see if the numbers at least match up. And fortunately, they did. I see 2206, 2210, and then I find 2214. I park my vehicle and get out. I start heading towards the house and up the driveway. I get to the front door and knock on it. No answer. I knock again, and then out of nowhere, all the lights turn off. I'm a little confused. Obviously someone is in the house. I figure maybe it's my friends playing a trick on me, so I head around the house to a window to look inside. When I get to the window, I look inside and I can't see much. And then I see a dark figure run by. Honestly, it kind of creeped me out. I keep looking in when I see the figure run by again. I'm so confused. What is going on? I knock on the window and say, hello? And then the figure slowly walks by and stops. It slowly turns towards me. It's just looking at me for a good 30 seconds. I don't know what to do at this point. I say again, hello? Right as I say that, the figure runs straight towards me at full speed and slams its face against the window. I jump back and see that it's an old woman. She's not wearing any clothes. Her hair is thin and gray. She looks at me deep into my eyes and smiles slowly as a line of blood runs down her head from where she hit her head on the window. She has no teeth, 
just a smile that sent chills down my spine. I start walking backwards when this woman starts screaming at me. She's screaming and smiling and laughing while crying. It freaked me out so bad that I sprinted back to my car and drove away. I drove home and called my friend. He told me I turned down the street before his street. I made a wrong turn and ended up at a house with the same numbered address. That was the creepiest thing I'd ever experienced. The setting. Dark. Gravel road. Covered in leaves. Me. Alone. Lost. I was trying to find my way to my boyfriend's house, but I took a wrong turn. My phone was dead. I forgot my charger. The road went for a few miles before I eventually came up to a dead end sign. I was scared. Scared that I was lost, but relieved that I found a dead end sign because all that it meant was that I only had one direction to go, which was back the other way. I turned my car around and started driving when I slammed on my brakes. In the road was another dead end sign. How did that sign get there? I could swear that I turned around on the same road. So how could it be there? Maybe I took another wrong turn. So I made a U-turn. I drove for a few minutes down the street when all of a sudden, another dead end sign. This was impossible. I didn't make a wrong turn this time. How did that sign get there? I'm terrified now. Every time I turned my car around, there was a new dead end sign in front of me. I get out of my car in a panic. I look around, and all around me were dead end signs everywhere. I was trapped in this one spot in the road. I screamed out, what is happening? and then I hear laughter from all around me. I start spinning in circles, trying to run from this laughter. I'm crying, I'm screaming, I don't know what to do, when all at once, the laughter stops. It's pure silence, until I hear footsteps behind me on the gravel. I turn around, and there's a man in a black hooded gown. He points at me, I'm scared frozen in my spot, and then the man runs at me with a long knife in his hand. I turn to run, but my feet are bound to the ground with the leaves and vines from the ground holding me still. I have nowhere to go. The man runs closer and closer as I'm screaming, and then he runs his long knife into my throat. The blood starts spraying everywhere. I fall to my knees. I pull the knife from my neck as the man takes the hood down from his gown, and then I see that he has no head. He takes the knife from my hands and repeatedly stabs me in the neck until my head is severed from my body. He picks up my head and places it in the spot where his head should be, and then I die. Everything turns black, and then it happens. I wake up and life is back to normal. I'm now sitting in my psychiatrist's office, explaining this reoccurring dream I've had for the last six years. I'm afraid that I'll never sleep well again. When I was in my early 30s, I remember I had to travel to a town four hours over from mine for work. I recently was promoted, and I had to do training in a different office. So I'm driving, trying to find this location when I realize nothing is looking like the town that my boss said it would. He said I'd see a Taco Bell and a big hotel as I entered the town, but I didn't see any of that. I must have taken the wrong exit or the wrong turn or something. So I pull into this rural area. There's only one house for every mile of road. I pull into the driveway of this one single house. It's an old, disgusting house, with broken down cars everywhere, and old newspapers all over the ground. It was filthy, but I was lost, and I needed directions. 
so I head to the front door and ring the bell, but nobody answers. I ring a few more times, but still no luck. I'm about to go back to my car when I hear some voices in the woods behind this house. Normally, I'd ignore it and leave, but I was low on gas and needed to know where to go. So I go behind the house. The voices are starting to get louder as I approach the woods. I'm trying to stay quiet because I'm a little bit nervous. I can see through some of the trees and I see a fire. I walk a little closer and I can see a group of people standing around the fire. I watch them for a few minutes when I can start hearing what they're saying. They are chanting a weird chant and then I can also see something in the background. It's a man. He's in his underwear. He's hanging from a tree. His body is bloody and cut up and a noose is around his neck. These people are walking up to him one by one. They each have a knife and are cutting into his side and having blood pour from him into a cup. I'm getting weak and my knees are giving out from the fear of what I'm seeing. These people killed this guy and they are each holding a cup full of his blood. They keep chanting out loud while holding their cups until the chanting stops. They all hold their cups to the sky and they scream out loud, O oh, Dark Lord, take our souls and forever may we serve you. And then they drink the blood. I let out a huge gasp of air. <sighs> That's when they all turn their heads at me. They see me and then they all start running at me. I turn and run back to my car as these people are screaming out, get her. I make it into my car and start driving away. I look into my mirror and I can see them all standing there watching me leave. I made it to a nearby town and I used the phone to call the police. The cops ask where this location is, but I don't remember, so they couldn't go investigate. Nothing ever happened to those people as far as I know, but I'm so glad they didn't catch me. The Halloween night of 1976 left me traumatized. I was 12 years old and the sky was going dark. The sun going down meant one and only one thing, time to trick or treat. I threw on my costume and told my dad I was leaving. I was going out by myself because at 12 years old, I felt like I was old enough to do that kind of thing. But that was a huge mistake. Back in the 70s, Parents didn't see a problem with young kids going out at night alone, especially on Halloween. So I left the house alone and confident. I was almost running from house to house, getting my pumpkin-shaped candy basket filled up so quickly. Things were fine until I arrived at this one house. It wasn't decorated at all, but that didn't stop me. I walk up the driveway to the house. I knock on the door. No one answers, but I can see the lights are on, so I knock again. I knock probably four times until finally a man in his 40s opens up. He is fat and he is bald on the top of his head, except for a greasy comb over. He looks mad as he answers the door, but it seemed like once he saw me, his attitude changed and he was very friendly. He was giving me compliments on my ninja costume. I said thank you, and then he kind of stared at me, looking me up and down. I felt kind of weirded out. I said, do you have any candy? He said, oh, oh, yes, yes, sorry. I forgot to put it out. Hold on one second. He looked around left to right for a moment, and then he said, are you by yourself? I said, yes. He said, where are your parents? I said, they're at home. It was at this point that his friendly attitude faded. He stepped out onto his front porch and looked side to side. He walked back into his house, looked straight into my eyes, and then violently grabbed me. I dropped my basket and tried to fight him off. He was pulling at me, trying to pull me into his house. I screamed, help, help. 
a man across the street who was with his son saw what was happening. He ran over and pulled me from the guy's hands. This man started punching the creep. The guy who tried to take me was now laying on his ground and bloody. His lip was busted open. This dad asked if I was okay and took me home. He told my dad what happened and my dad called the cops. The creep was arrested and we later found out that he was a criminal child molester. Thank God for that random guy being in the right place at the right time. This is a story that happened to me and a group of my friends back in high school. I haven't wanted to share it because it was very traumatic for me. But here it goes. I was one of the popular girls. I wasn't a cheerleader or anything, but I was well known among the school. And I'll admit that the group of friends I had and I weren't very nice to people we thought weren't as cool as us. Especially this girl who I will just call Ashley. Ashley was a girl who I knew since 7th grade. She was always kind of weird to me. Didn't have many friends. As the years went on from 7th grade to our junior year, I grew in popularity and she kind of stayed in the shadows. My friends and I used to torment this girl, making fun of her black clothes and her pale skin and the way she didn't know how to correctly apply her eye makeup. We were so mean to her. Almost daily we would put her in tears. I remember Halloween weekend was upon us, and the Friday before we got out of school, we were making fun of her because she wore her costume to school. She was a bumblebee, and again, we put her in tears. But while my friends were all laughing, I remember hearing her say something in her shooken voice. She said, Halloween, and then walked away in a hurry. Then, that next day, Saturday, was Halloween. I remember I was a Playboy bunny. I had my friend Becca with me, and we left around 5 to meet up at our friend David's house to go trick-or-treating with a few friends. The sun went down, and our group left David's house and started hitting up houses. After being out for an hour or so, we noticed that behind us was someone wearing a bumblebee costume, but a scary devil mask too. They weren't going house to house. They were just following us. I remember David shouted out to the person, What the fuck do you want? The person removed the mask. It was Ashley. She had this intense look of hatred on her face. David laughed once he realized it was her. He yelled again, Go home, freak. You think you're going to hang with us? We all started laughing. But Ashley didn't move, just kept staring. David tried stepping up again, probably to try to impress us, and he started walking at Ashley. I could hear him yell out at her as he walked saying, Go home, bitch! Right after he said that, Ashley pulled out a large pair of scissors and lunged at David. David tried to run, but Ashley drove the scissors into his back. She pulled them out and stabbed him again. She was screaming like an animal. The other guys in our group ran up and pulled Ashley off of him. We called the cops and David was escorted to the hospital. He ended up being okay and Ashley got arrested. But seeing Ashley attack him like that on Halloween was terrifying. She must have been planning that attack for a while. Last night, October 30th, I went to a Halloween party at my buddy's house. The day started off with me going to work. It was only a six hour shift because my boss let us go home early. I went home and started getting ready for this party. I'm 28, so I didn't really feel like dressing up much. I really only cared about getting there to start drinking. So I just wore my regular clothes with a Freddy Krueger mask. I get to the party at around nine. Loud dance music is playing. People are taking shots. Weed is being smoked in the backyard. Girls are puking out front. It looks like a pretty good time so far. So I start drinking and dancing with some girls. A few friends of mine were there, and I met a few new cool people. So needless to say, we were taking pictures on our phones all night. 
A few hours goes by and the party is slowing down, so I call for an Uber and get a ride home. Then I wake up the next morning, and this is where the story shifts. I'm laying in bed, hungover, barely any memory of the night. I reach over to my nightstand and grab a water bottle to drink. I'm laying in bed with my eyes shut when my phone buzzes. I grab it, and it's my friend Tom texting me saying how much fun he had last night. I laugh to myself a little and then remember that I have a whole new gang of pictures in my phone to look at. I open up my pictures and start sliding through them. Looks like I had a good time. But then I notice in one of the pictures that I'm in, there's a dark figure standing behind me. I swipe to the next picture, and that figure is behind me in that one too. I start going through every picture and realize that this dark figure is standing behind me in every one. I send a few pics to my friend and ask him who that guy is behind me. My friend texts back and says he never saw anyone at that party like that. This freaked me out. I jump out of bed and sit at my computer desk. I plug in my phone and upload my pictures. Once they've uploaded, I zoom in on the figure. Its face is too blurry to make out, but I'm starting to get really scared by it. As I zoomed in on the face, I hear footsteps approaching behind me. I live alone, so who could be behind me? I turn around in my chair really fast, but no one is there. I'm thinking my mind is playing tricks on me, so I turn back around. When I do that, the footsteps start again. I flip around once more to again see no one. My heart starts beating fast, and then I get a horrible idea. I grab my phone, unlock the screen, I press the camera app. I turn it to selfie mode and hold it up in front of my face. I put my thumb over the camera button and click it. I go to look at the picture, and when I do, I drop my phone and the screen shatters. I pick up my phone, and there it is. The figure was standing right behind me. Halloween used to be my favorite holiday. That statement does not hold true today. I took my two boys out trick-or-treating a year ago. It was a very exciting day. My boys just turned old enough to really get excited to walk house to house. So we were really excited to go out that night. My son was the Red Power Ranger and my youngest boy was Darth Vader. They looked adorable. We got ready for the night and then stood by the door for pictures. When picture time was done, the boys grabbed their pillowcases and we marched out of the house. The experience was great. The kids were loving it. We spent a good hour going door to door and then we called it quits. The children's feet hurt, but they were so excited to dump out their candy that they didn't care about the pain. We get home and the boys rip off their masks and jump to their knees on the floor. They each dump out their sacks of candy. They're having a blast eating all of these sugary treats. I'm in my room taking off my face makeup when my oldest says, Mom, what is it, honey? My son comes running into my room. He says, what is this? I look into his small hand to see what he is holding. My eyes focus on it, and then I gasp as my stomach turns sour. My son was holding something from his candy that wasn't candy. It was a bloody human ear. My wife and I are the kinds of parents who want to take our kids to do a ton of fun things. My wife is great about finding the events that we do. She approaches me with the idea of taking the kids on a haunted train ride. Sounds good to me. We pay for our tickets online and go the following day to the train station. When we arrive, the Halloween spirit was in the air. The train was done up with scarecrows and pumpkins and cobwebs. It was awesome. We dressed up the kids in their Halloween costumes. 
It was so cute. We board the train. The conductor gives a silly and corny introduction. Something about this train has been haunted for hundreds of years and blah blah blah. It was cheesy, but the kids enjoyed it. The train honks its horn and it starts rolling. We were in the very front. We paid extra money so that we could have the best seats. The train was more of a sightseeing experience, so it wasn't going very fast, but definitely fast enough to where you'd get hurt if you jumped out for whatever reason. It was awesome because they had people dressed like zombies and vampires standing around the tracks. As you went by, they tried scaring you by pretending to reach for the train. It was so fun, until about 30 minutes in. We were all hanging over the side of the train, watching people go by, and then we saw a woman. She wasn't dressed up like the other people on the ground were. She wasn't trying to reach for the train either. She just stood there with her head down. As the train approached her, I could hear the conductor on the radio saying there was someone by the tracks. I looked at my wife in confusion. I looked back out of the train and back at the woman. The woman lay down on the tracks right before the train got there. I screamed to the conductor to stop the train. He heard me and pulled the emergency brakes, but the train was too close and it rolled over the woman. Her body was split into two at her torso. Blood sprayed out over the side of the train. Everyone in the train was screaming. The kids thankfully didn't realize what happened though. The train came to a stop and the adult and conductor jumped off the train and ran back to where the lady was. But when we ran back to her, there was no body. No one could explain how this was possible. Maybe the train really was haunted. My husband and I bought our first home back in 1984. It was a decent neighborhood. Not much crime happened. It wasn't great, but it was what we could afford. But within five years, the neighborhood quickly got worse. The crime rate had went up drastically. And in 1989, many homes in our city were getting broken into. I was quite worried it would happen to us. So my husband bought a few extra locks for the doors and the windows. But one night, in July of 89, I was sleeping in our upstairs bedroom. It was a very humid night, so against my gut instinct, I slept with my window open. Around 4 a.m., I wake up to a faint scream. I opened my eyes, not sure if I even heard anything. But then I heard another scream. I jumped out of bed and looked out my window to see what it was, and my eyes widened bigger than I thought they could ever stretch. I could see into my neighbor's bedroom. She was lying, stomach down, on her bed, with two men hovering over her. They were repeatedly stabbing her in the back. I tried to scream, but the sight of seeing someone being murdered took my breath away. I ran downstairs and called the police, and they showed up, but it was too late. The men were gone, and so was the life that once lived in my neighbor's body. It was a cold winter morning. My alarm went off. Snooze number one. Five minutes later, snooze number two. Finally, after the third alarm, I had to wake up. I'm a single mother of three kids and it was always a full-on war getting them ready for school and also getting myself ready for work. I'm rushing around the house, setting cereal and milk on the table and heating up my soup in the microwave. I finally finish getting the kids' teeth brushed and their backpacks ready, and we pack into my truck. I check the time in the truck. Great, already seven minutes late to work, and I still have to drop the kids off at school. 
We arrive to their school. I give them all a kiss, and I see them walk into their classroom. Now, it's time for me to speed the whole way to work. I cut a few corners and finally make it onto the freeway. I'm going 85 miles per hour, weaving in and out of traffic. I'm taking sips of my hot soup while trying to concentrate on the road. And then a car slows down in front of me, and I swerve around it. As I do that, I drop my soup on my lap. Shit! I look down to pick it up, and that's when I look up and see just a few feet in front of me. A man was standing in the middle of the freeway. I slammed my brakes, but I was going so fast, I hit the guy. His body was torn apart. With the speed that I was going, and the size of my truck, it literally ripped his arms off and broke the bones out of his neck and torso. Blood was all over my truck. I have seen disturbing things in my life, but I've never seen someone die before, and it was my fault. I'm a small town boy from Utah. I've always had an interest in sightseeing. I've seen many awesome things, like the White House, the Empire State Building, the Twin Towers before they came down, and the next sight I always wanted to see in person was the Golden Gate Bridge. I saved up my money, and after a few months, I was finally financially able to take the trip to San Francisco. I made the drive from Utah to San Francisco in great time, and I made sure before I left to charge my camera since I planned on taking amazing pictures from the middle of the bridge. I got to San Francisco and headed straight to the bridge. I walked halfway across it and stopped. The view from that high up over the bay was so beautiful. Other tourists were taking pictures with their loved ones and friends. Everyone was friendly and talking to one another. But I noticed there was this girl. She wasn't talking to anyone. She wasn't smiling, wasn't taking pictures. She looked like she was in a daze. Now, I'm a very friendly person. So I walked up and tried to strike a conversation with her, and she was very standoffish. She looked nervous. After several attempts to talk to her, I gave up, and I looked back off of the bridge and out into the ocean again. I saw from the corner of my eye, the woman started to walk behind my vision. I figured she was leaving, and then out of nowhere, I hear footsteps running up behind me. I turned to look and the woman places both hands on the railing, throws her feet up, and jumps off of the bridge. I watch her fall down so far, and her body smacks the water below. We all call the police to report what happened. The police find her body. She was dead. Nearly every bone in her body was broken. About nine years ago, I needed to go grocery shopping. I invited my little cousin, who at the time I was living with, to go with me. We both got in my truck and drove to the local Costco. After we finished shopping, we loaded up the bed of my truck and started driving home. We were driving through a neighborhood and we were behind this one car. This car was driving very slow and I was getting annoyed. I was about to honk at them when I saw the passenger roll his window down, stick out a handgun and pointed at these two Middle Eastern men who were walking down the street. I was in shock when I saw the gun go off about eight times. This passenger just shot these two guys multiple times and then screeched the wheels and took off. I parked my truck and my cousin and I ran to the men. One of the guys was dead. The other was still alive, but blood was going everywhere. We called the police, but by the time the ambulance arrived, the other man died too. That was the craziest thing I had ever seen. We found out later that it was a hate crime. I used to go to the bars in my early 20s. I used to drink a lot. All my friends were drinkers, but that is not the life that I live anymore. I went out with some of my closest buddies on a Friday night. We all met up at the local sports bar, all except one of my friends. He was running late, I guess. We ordered a round of shots to start off the night, and then a follow-up beer for each of us. About 15 minutes after being there, my friend shows up, but he's not alone. He brought this other guy with him. 
He said it was a guy he works with. Normally, I don't mind new people, but when you're drinking, you never know how someone might behave when they're drunk. So I was a little flustered about that, but oh well. An hour or so goes by, and we are getting pretty drunk at this point. The crowd is pretty weak, not many girls, and the jukebox was broken, so there was absolutely no music playing. We decided to call a cab and take the hangout to my house. When we arrive, I bust out the beers and the bottle of Jack. We start hitting the alcohol pretty hard and set up the cups for beer pong. I called first dibs on the first game, and so did my friend and his work buddy. The game started off friendly, and then got kind of competitive. I hate to brag, but I'm a beast at beer pong, so needless to say, my team was dominating. Everyone was laughing and cracking jokes at one another, but I noticed this work friend wasn't smiling, he wasn't laughing, he wasn't saying much at all. My teammate looks over at him and says, What's wrong, bro? Sore loser? Everyone laughs, but this guy looks at him and says something very offensive, and he's not joking when he says it. He said, I'm just pissed that I'm losing to a faggot. My teammate says, What did you say? Are you calling me a faggot? The guy says, Yeah, I am. And then he gets into my friend's face. The tension rose, and so did the voice levels. Eventually, my friend swung a punch at the guy. This is where it turned ugly. My friend hit him a few times, but then swung again and missed the guy. This guy then jumps on my friend's back and throws a chokehold on him. At first, it seemed like my buddy could handle it, but then he starts tapping on the guy's arm. We all notice and say, Yo dude, chill the fuck out! Get off of him! This infuriates the man. He squeezes harder. Now I can see my friend is literally being choked to death. A few of us jump on this man and try prying his arms off, but we weren't successful. I see my friend's eyes bulge out, and the veins in his eyes burst and go blood red. His neck is being crushed. His face is going in and out of blue and purple colors. My friend's body goes from a tight struggle to limp. His arms fall to the floor. Now I get up and smash a beer bottle over his head. It knocks the guy out. We rush to my friend and try to shake him awake, but nothing we did, the shaking, the slapping his face, the CPR, nothing we did helped. We called the police and not even the paramedics could help. This work friend killed one of my best friends, right in front of me. Warning, this video contains stories that have mature content. Content including rape, murder, and body mutilation. These stories are fictional, but some are based on true events. Enter into this video at your own will. You've been warned. I was in a short relationship when I was 30. It only lasted about two months. His name was Mark. I called it off because he was very jealous. He was jealous since the beginning. At first, I found it flattering and cute. When we were out in public and a guy checked me out, Mark would put his arm around me and pull me in close to him. When a guy would interact with me on Snapchat, Mark would get mad and say he better not be thinking of talking to my girl. I found it charming, like he would protect me, but then he started getting a little too jealous. My friend Tina was over one time, and she mentioned a guy that she ran into from high school that we both knew. Mark got up and started pacing back and forth, but the final red flag for me was when Mark came home from work, and I was on the phone with my dad. Mark told me to get off of the phone. I looked at him like, are you serious? It's my dad. So I ignored his order. Then he grabbed my phone and threw it against the wall. That night was when I ended it. A month later, I met a guy and we started dating after some time. His name was Brett. He was a very outgoing guy. 
tons of tattoos and piercings. He even had his dick pierced. To be honest, I thought that was really cool. But I wanted to be sure that he wasn't a psycho like Mark was. And thankfully, he wasn't. We dated for six months, and everything was fine. But one night, Brett was supposed to come over for dinner. But he never showed. This was unusual. Brett always answered my calls. I texted him a few times, but he never wrote back. This went on for three days. I was starting to get really worried. I called around looking for him, but no one had heard from him. Towards the end of the third day, I decided to go to sleep, and if I hadn't heard from him by morning, I would file a police report. In the middle of the night, I thought I heard someone in my apartment. I got up and looked around, but it was empty. I checked my phone to see if I had received anything from Brett, but sadly I had not. So I set my phone back on the nightstand, and I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning reached over to my nightstand to grab my phone, but it wasn't there. I thought maybe I set it on my bed and it got mixed into my blankets. I pulled the comforter back and screamed so loud and jumped out of bed. There, sitting next to me, was a severed penis with a piercing in it, and tied to the penis with a ribbon was a note that said, Love Mark. I experienced a horrible situation in my early 40s. I was dating a man who was very controlling. Every little thing I would do, I was doing it wrong to him. Every time I wanted to leave the house, he made me feel incredibly guilty. He always needed to know who I was talking to. He even became violent when I did not obey him. It was a nightmare, so I left him. He was very remorseful. He apologized and promised he would change, but I wasn't buying it, and he finally accepted it and stopped trying. A few weeks after the breakup, my ex contacted me and asked me to meet up so he could return some of my things. He offered to meet in public if I didn't feel comfortable, but I told him it was okay and I would just meet him at his new apartment. That was the biggest mistake I would ever make. I arrived to his place and I knock on the door. When he opened the door, he grabbed me by the arm and pointed a gun in my face. He ordered me to quietly get into his car. He blindfolded me and drove me to some random location. When he took off my blindfold, I was standing in front of a cabin in the woods. He pushed me into the cabin with his gun pressed against my back. He tied me up and threw me to the floor. He proceeded to rape me over and over again. Every time he finished, he would tell me that we were going to be together forever. After a week of being held captive by my ex, he blindfolded me again and ordered me into his car. I felt the car come to a stop after driving for about an hour. He removed my blindfold and we were parked in front of a jewelry store. He undid my ties around my hands and he told me what the plan was. We were going to buy a ring, and he was going to make me marry him, and if I didn't go with the plan, he was going to kill me. We entered the store and approached the jeweler. My ex kept his arm around me the whole time and kept my body close to his. He had a forceful grip around my arm. The jeweler helped us look at some rings. He kept asking us questions about how long we've been together and details about our relationship. I could tell that the jeweler was feeling suspicious, and my ex could tell too. So he grabbed me and politely said that we had to think over our options, and he turned us to leave the store. He shoved me back into the car and warned me not to make a move or he would blow my brains out. He started up the car and put it in reverse. As we started to back out, a swarm of police cars blocked us in and drew their guns. My ex was arrested and I was informed that the jeweler pressed a silent alarm button while we were in the store. That jeweler saved my life. My name is Chelsea 
I'm in my 40s now, but roughly 10 years ago, I had an experience that still terrifies me to this day. I had went through a weird time in my life when I had some psychotic person following me. He was everywhere I was. When I went to the store, he was there. When I went to my yoga class, he was in the same parking lot. One day, I even saw him in the lobby of my hotel job. When that happened, I told the security guard to escort the man. He escorted him and came back and said to me that the man said that I was his ex-girlfriend. I had never spoken to this man before. I've only ever seen him when he followed me. I got really worried, like maybe he was unstable or something, and I didn't know what else he would be capable of. I'm in a relationship, so I called my boyfriend and asked him if he could come stay the night at my house, just in case. Of course he agreed, and he showed up later that night. My boyfriend and I ordered some food and were watching a movie. He could tell that I was still thinking about what had happened earlier. And I was trying to move on from those feelings, but those feelings came back when my house phone rang. I picked it up. The only thing I could hear was some breathing. I slammed down the phone and started to have a panic attack, but my boyfriend was great to me. He tried to comfort me and calm me down, and it worked, and ultimately we ended up getting sexual. We moved into the bedroom and started getting really into it. He was on top of me, kissing my neck and chest. I was looking up at the ceiling and taking in all of the emotions. I closed my eyes and turned my head to the left. But when I opened my eyes, I saw something. I pushed my boyfriend off and let out a scream as I pointed to the window. In the shadows was a man hanging upside down from the roof. He was staring into my window at us. My boyfriend jumped up and put his jeans on and ran outside to find this guy, but the man was long gone. I never 100% was sure if it was the obsessed guy or not, but after that, I never saw that guy again. Maybe he moved on, or was too scared to continue harassing me, but either way, I hope no one else has to suffer from the fear like I did. In my late twenties, I was dating this man who in the beginning of our relationship was super nice, but he had an anger problem. I met him at an LGBT group night. We were both single men and were really into fitness. Our first date was at the gym, lifting weights together and talking. We dated for nine months, but I couldn't take his anger fits anymore. It seemed like whenever I offended him, Something that I owned would end up getting broken, but the last straw was when he punched me. I ended our relationship after it got physical that night. It was a disgusting breakup. Things were said, very bad and mean things. Objects were thrown, and tears were cried out. I really loved him, so it was hard to end it. I told him I never wanted to hear from him again, but of course, he didn't listen. He would always text me every few days, saying things like, Good morning, baby. He tried to be so sweet, but I had to tell him to knock it off, and then immediately it would turn to fuck you and I hate you from him. This went on for a few weeks until he finally got the hint. A month passed by, and then I was at the gym one day when I noticed that he was at the gym that I was at at the same time. He came up to me and asked how I had been doing. It was nice to hear from him in a nice controlled setting. He asked if I needed a spotter when I did my bench press. I figured this was okay, so I said yeah that would be great. I lay down on the bench and did a few reps at low weight. And once I did a few sets, I put on my max weight. We counted together, one, two, three and then we both lifted the bar. I brought the bar down to my chest and pushed it back up with a little bit of help. I went back down and did another rep, but then I went back down and struggled to push it up. I asked him to help me, but he didn't. He looked down at me with a disgusted expression. 
he leaned down and whispered in my ear, Fuck you. My arms were shaking so hard, and then they gave out. The bar fell down to my neck and started suffocating me. I felt like my neck was going to snap in half. I tried to scream for help, but my throat was smashed shut. My ex just stared at me as my eyes began to bulge from my sockets. And then suddenly, the bar was lifted off of me by some guys. They asked if I was okay, and then turned to my ex and started cussing him out. One of the guys called 911 on him and accused him of attempted murder. My ex denied it, but there were plenty of witnesses around and plenty of cameras. I guess the lesson learned was to never let your ex spot you.